Please are in listen only mode. Do I have to manage that thing too? No. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Siler Glural Seminar Series, and I'd like to introduce Craig Stowe to introduce our speaker. Um, good morning, and thanks everybody for uh, being here this morning. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Craig. Kevin is, I guess, originally from North Carolina, did his bachelor's degree at North Carolina State, and then went out to the other coast for a while, uh, did a master's degree at the uh, University of Washington, and then came back to North Carolina, where he did a PhD at Duke University down at the Duke Marine Lab, then he left North Carolina again for a while and was at Florida for a few years, and now he is back in North Carolina, about a stone's throw from the Duke Marine Lab at one of our sister cousin labs, the uh, Noah Beaufort Lab, and he's with, there with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, Kevin has, what, for 10 or 12 years now probably been studying the fishery in and around the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, he, he pulled me out there on a cruise with him, what, 10, or, 10 years ago probably. Was it that long ago? Uh, and I, I never worked so hard in my life. I was up to my elbows in fish slime and, and cut up uh, by uh, Atlantic Bumper and all kinds of things. Uh, and I'm sort of looking forward to going back at some point. But we're real glad Kevin's come up to uh, talk to us today about his work there. And uh, I get the title of his talk is The Gulf of Mexico Dead Zone, Linking Hypoxia to fish and fisheries, and I'm really pleased that, uh, to uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Kevin Craig. Thanks, Craig. Oh, what Craig did mention is he was on my dissertation committee, and I think he was the only one of five members who actually read my dissertation, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I, uh, I was telling Craig last night, I think we've um, been working in parallel on similar issues for uh, quite a while now, so it's nice to get the opportunity to come and share some of the work that we've been doing and um, also learn about some of what uh, you've been doing here and hopefully develop some future collaborations. <clears throat> it's not advancing. <laughs> Okay, I can do it with the mouse. Okay, that's fine. Um, so a question a lot of people are interested in is whether hypoxia has negative effects on fisheries, uh, and it's a difficult question because it's tough to separate any potential negative effects of hypoxia from um, the stimulatory effects of adding nutrients to systems that are typically nutrient limited. Uh, this is a data from 27 marine ecosystems and 21 freshwater ecosystems, and uh, you see a pretty clear relationship between the nutrient levels in the system, which uh, stimulate primary productivity, and the fishery landings that, uh, that are uh, removed from those systems. And this has been termed the agricultural model of eutrophication, and it was uh, in vogue for quite a while. Um, and basically is an input-output model. The more nutrients you put in, the more yield in terms of fisheries production that you'll get out. That was questioned in a paper that's about 20 years old now by John Caddy, where he said that that relationship can't be monotonic. There's got to be some limit to the, um, the beneficial effects of nutrient inputs in terms of fishery yields. And he suggested that once you exceed some level of nutrient enrichment, you start to get a variety of negative effects, uh, low oxygen, harmful algal blooms, uh, increased heterotrophy that have some negative consequences for fisheries. Um, this is a conceptual model that was put forth a while ago. Um, there's a lot of interest in whether this hump actually exists in the real world, and we don't have a lot of evidence from systems of declines in fisheries production that are, that are associated with with hypoxia or other other um, other things uh, associated with nu nutrient over enrichment. <clears throat> what we do know is hypoxia has certainly been increasing worldwide. This is from a paper that Bob Diaz published in Science a few years ago, where he collated the um, the reports of hypoxia across decades, 
beginning in the 1910s, and, and you see this gradual increase in the cumulative number of sites worldwide that report um, hypoxic conditions. And beginning in the 1960s, you start to see a decadal doubling and the number of systems where hypoxia has been reported. And this was a period that uh, was basically the advent of industrial agriculture and um, in dramatic increases in fertilizer use that um, are, are driving this pattern. <clears throat> and we see evidence for both of these in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. If you look at that top right plot, that's a map of uh, total demersal biomass in the northwestern Gulf that was put together by uh, a scientist named Darnell in the early 1960s, prior to when we think hypoxia was an issue. And what you see is the, the highest levels of demersal uh, biomass tend to occur on the inner Louisiana shelf associated with the Mississippi Plume region. Uh, those same regions are now subject to bottom water hypoxia for large periods of the summer. Uh, these are maps of um, the spatial extent of oxygen levels less than two milligrams per liter that are uh, generated from cruises uh, conducted by Nancy Rabelais each summer. And this is a, a recurrent feature. Uh, it tends to occur from May to August, although it's been detected as early as February, as late as September, October. Typically extends over the bottom one to two meters uh, of the water column, but under certain um, physical conditions can extend over much larger uh, portions of the bottom water column. The suggestion has been that um, hypoxia has always existed at some level in this system, but it's really um, intensified, particularly since the early 1970s, uh, <clears throat> to the point where now we see hypoxic zones regularly exceeding 20,000 square kilometers or so. And there's been a bit of a debate going on about whether this uh, has effects on fisheries. Um, there's been some suggestion, some presumption, I guess, of, of negative effects. These are some quotes that I pulled from a, a couple of publications. One is from a Ecological Society of America uh, hypoxia brochure where they say, Hypoxia causes years of weak recruitment to adult populations and can result in overall reductions or destabilizations of important stocks. That's a pretty, pretty definitive statement. Um, another paper said hypoxia is now recognized as one of the most significant threats to fisheries worldwide. <clears throat> and I was involved in a review paper that uh, was led by Kenny Rose a couple of years ago that questioned uh, these presumptions and said the evidence for hypoxia having widespread and general effects on coastal fish populations is actually pretty weak. Um, we should stop making general statements which imply that hypoxia effects on fish populations are actually common, but also that quantifying these effects and, and understanding whether they're large or, or small is critical for effectively managing uh, coastal ecosystems and to um, help inform uh, nutrient remediation actions. <clears throat> so if you think about how hypoxia might influence fisheries, um, there are two fundamentally different pathways. Uh, one is through effects on biological production. So organisms either inhabit low oxygen water or they avoid low oxygen water and move to uh, suboptimal habitats and that has consequences on their growth rates. Uh, the mortality rates, the reproduction uh, that's manifest in a population level effect. And this is the route that's most often been studied. Um, people have done a lot of work in the lab and in the field trying to look at how animals respond to hypoxia and what the consequences are in terms of their demographic rates. The other route that I think is, is, is interesting and much less, uh, has received much less attention is how does hypoxia influence the harvest dynamics of fisheries? Um, we know that animals respond spatially uh, to, to hypoxia. How does that influence the distribution of uh, a fishermen, their behavior, uh, what they're targeting, their harvest efficiency? And so it's this second route that I'm going to focus a little bit on today and, and show you some of the studies that we've been doing to try to look at how hypoxia is influencing spatial distributions of harvested species, bycatch species, and then also the, the, the fishery itself. <clears throat> 
So just to give you an outline for the talk, um, I got three things I'll cover. One is the uh, hypoxia effects on the spatial distribution of organisms. Uh, we've done a lot of retrospective analysis of long-term fishery survey data. Uh, so you'll, you'll hear me refer to CMAP quite a bit. That's a long-term um, uh, fishery independent trawl and hydrographic survey that's been going on for about 30 years in the northwestern Gulf. Uh, we also have done, similar to people here at this lab, some higher resolution trawl and hydrographic cruises in particular regions of the hypoxic zone to try to get at uh, more fine-scale distributional responses to low oxygen. And a lot of what I'll show is, um, is data for brown shrimp, which is the primary target of the commercial uh, fishery. It's an annual species that um, spawns in the wintertime, recruits to estuaries in winter and spring, and then migrates to the shelf uh, during the summer where it's uh, subject to the shrimp trawl fishery. And then Atlantic croaker, which is one of the dominant demersal species on the shelf. It's also a, um, one of the larger components of the bycatch of the shrimp fishery. And it has a life history that's very typical of many other species there. It's, uh, it's also estuarine dependent, a winter spawner, um, and then migrates to the shelf both in the spring and then in, in the fall where it's uh, taken its bycatch in the commercial shrimp fishery. Then I'll talk a little bit about some work we've been trying to do to look at how the fishery itself is responding to hypoxia. Uh, we've done some synoptic aerial and hydrographic surveys to map the bottom oxygen conditions and also the distribution of shrimpers um, simultaneously. And then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, analysis of shrimp vessel monitoring data, which is uh, something we've recently gotten into um, there's a program that outfits shrimp boats with, uh, with vessel monitoring systems that track the location and the speed and so forth. And we've just started to tap into that to try to look at uh, how uh, the fishery may be responding uh, at a much larger spatial scale. And then I'll shift gears a little bit and look at some community and ecosystem indicators um, try to put hypoxia uh, effects in the context of other changes that are going on in the ecosystem, particularly uh, some recent changes in the, in the uh, amount of fishing effort uh, on the shelf. So we have a lot of evidence for changes in spatial distribution. This is a, shows a time series of the aerial extent of hypoxia from Nancy Rabelais' cruises. Um, these are interpolated maps of the spatial distribution of croaker on the left and brown shrimp on the right um, are integrated across several years where hypoxia was fairly small or, um, or non-existent. And what you see is uh, areas of high, or croaker tend to occur close to shore within the 20 meter depth contour. You see these areas of high density um, close to shore. Um, <clears throat> brown shrimp uh, much broader geographic distribution, uh, but also these high patches in these mid-shelf areas and, and along the shorelines. If you look at that same picture integrated across several years in the mid-1990s where hypoxia exceeded uh, 15,000 square kilometers, you see a very different picture. Uh, croaker uh, um, are, are displaced offshore of the hypoxic zone as well as inshore. You get these high density areas along these edges. Uh, with very few croaker caught within this uh, mid-shelf region. And similarly for, uh, for brown shrimp, uh, you can pretty much see the outline of the hypoxic zone based on where you do not catch shrimp. So there's shifts both inshore and, and offshore. And this area of habitat loss occurs in the areas that typically harbor the highest densities for, for these species. Again, if you look at this in terms of... Uh, distributional area or the area of the shelf over which 95% of shrimp occur, we've seen about a 25% decline in that area since the early 1990s. It's concurrent with this increase in the uh, spatial extent of hypoxia. Similarly for croaker, uh, we've seen about a 30 to 40% decline in their distributional range. Um, and we've also seen changes in patch structure. Uh, this is a measure of the average patch size 
of brown shrimp on the left, juvenile croaker on the right, versus the area of hypoxia. This is from the, the CMAP trawl surveys. And what you see is when hypoxia is fairly small in spatial extent, uh, brown shrimp occur in patches on average of about 200, 250 kilometers, um, while croaker occur in patches of about 100 to 150 kilometers. And there's a pretty uh, striking decline in patch size as the area of hypoxia increases. So that's suggestive of this, or reflective of this aggregation pattern. The animals are being displaced. Um, they're aggregating in areas outside of the hypoxic zone, often at fairly high densities. And we followed up some of this work with um, some more process-oriented cruises in particular regions of the hypoxic zone. This is the cruise that Craig mentioned that he was out on. Um, and this, it's, we, did, we conducted this in, uh, in late July in this region where uh, you tend to get chronic hypoxia. And one of the interesting things is hypoxia is often depicted as this large black low oxygen area, but there seems to be quite a bit of spatial structure in the hypoxic zone itself. Um, there's a lot of reticulation along these edges. Um, there's oxygenated shoals within the interior of the hypoxic zone. And there's very strong gradients between anoxic water and normoxic water. You can go from less than a milligram per liter to greater than four milligrams per liter over a distance of three to five kilometers. And this shows a distribution of, uh, of what was caught in the trawls associated with, the, with these surveys. So this is total CPUE and the, the, um, the crosses are areas where there's no catch. The circles are proportional to, to CPUE. And what you see is pretty clear avoidance of these anoxic low oxygen areas and some indication of aggregation. These high catches occur on the edges of the hypoxic zone. <clears throat> So we spent a lot of effort in trying to quantify that, exactly what are the avoidance thresholds um, for these species that are um, experiencing low oxygen conditions, and then where do they go uh, when they avoid it? This is from a, um, a threshold DO avoidance model that was based on three years of this high resolution trawl and, and hydrographic da data. Um, and what you see is um, pretty striking. The, the fish community seems pretty tolerant to low oxygen conditions. So these show the mean and the range, or the variance in the DO threshold for nine species um, on the shelf, ranging from brown shrimp, invertebrates, fish, croaker, spot, sea trout, pelagics like bumper and porgy. And on average, uh, DO thresholds across these species are about 1.5 milligrams per liter. So they're, they're fairly tolerant to low oxygen. And the range across these species is fairly narrow. Um, even though they differ considerably in life history type, um, whether they're obligate bottom dwellers or, or pelagic vertical migrators, we, these avoidance thresholds only vary by about a milligram per liter. So that, that was a, a bit of a surprise that there, there seemed to be a, a lot of similarity in, in how, the, uh, how the fish community is responding to low oxygen. Yes. Well, what what this is is sh I'm I'm not sure I understood the question. I think you're asking why there's Right. Yeah, I think these are actually model estimates. So this is a parameter that was estimated from a threshold model. So we looked at how animals were distributed relative to low oxygen and estimated a mean and a variance in, a, in an avoidance threshold across several species. So what you're seeing is that actual parameter estimate is the mean and the, and the, 
the distribution is re reflective of the variance around that mean. And one way you can interpret that is that species that have a um, high variance actually have a weak avoidance response, you know, because they're because because you know they're they're not avoiding that mean very strongly. Where species that have a very you know, narrow distribution of low variance have a very strong avoidance response. So, for example, if you look at this, um, croaker have an avoidance threshold of about two milligrams per liter, but it's a fairly weak avoidance response because it's a the variance on that is fairly high. Whereas something like uh, sand sea trout has an avoidance threshold of about 0.9 milligrams per liter, but it's a very narrow variance, suggesting it's a very strong avoidance response. This is where you see the greatest change in abundance across the oxygen gradient, right? And so if you think of animals distributed in space and along an oxygen gradient, where do you see the biggest decline in CPUE? And that's occurring at that mean value. And the, the width of that distribution is reflective of that rate of decline. How rapid is it decline? Is it a, is it a strong threshold or it's a very dramatic decline? Or is it more of a gradual thing where they kind of taper off as they as they get around that that oxygen level? So, that's a good question. The other thing that we looked at was how animals were distributed relative to the edge of the hypoxic zone. So here uh, is an example of brown shrimp. Uh, it's catch punit effort on the y-axis. And we calculated the distance of each of our sampling stations from our estimate of where the edge of the hypoxic zone was. And we got that by interpolating the bottom oxygen values um, and, and developing a contour line. So that zero is actually our estimate of where the edge is. The negative values are distances toward the interior of the hypoxic zone, so lower oxygen levels. And then the, the um, the positive values are distances away from the hypoxic zone. And what you see is if you just look at the, uh, the average response, the green line at the bottom, we don't really see much relationship between catch rates and distance from the edge of the hypoxic zone. But if you apply a quantile regression to this and look at the higher quantiles of the catch distribution, we see a very strong relationship with the edge of the hypoxic zone. So what this is saying is that as you look at the, 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 the higher and higher catch rates tend to occur closer and closer to that edge of the hypoxic zone, generally within about two to five kilometers, suggesting that, again, this aggregation effect uh, along the edge of that feature. Again, this is something that was quite general too. So this is the same graph you saw before, brown shrimp in the upper left. We see a similar pattern for um, Atlantic croaker, the top right, um, similar pattern for juvenile spot, and even for Atlantic bumper, which is a vertically migrating planktivore, we see, see this strong association with the edge of the hypoxic zone. So we're getting very strong aggregation of both targeted species like brown shrimp, as well as a variety of different types of, of fish, both demersal and pelagic, within relatively short distances of the edge of the, that feature. So what that suggests is what's happening here is even though this is a very large area, roughly 20,000 square kilometers in some years, the effects are fairly localized in nature. Um, I think of it as a, as, a, as a halo around the hypoxic zone where organisms are avoiding the lowest levels of oxygen, the lethal levels, but uh, you're getting aggregation uh, along this edge at fairly short distances, um, less than five kilometers or so. And this is something that people have seen in work here at this lab as well. Um, what was a little surprising is how similar that avoidance and aggregation response was across species. Um, we also saw a contraction in spatial distribution, decreases in patch size, both at a, at a local scale and at a shelf-wide scale. And I, I, didn't, I didn't show this, but we've also looked at overlap 
uh, between target species like brown shrimp and bycatch and juvenile finfish. And, and as you might expect based on their behavioral response, you tend to get higher spatial overlap um, in, in years when hypoxia is more severe. <clears throat> So what I want to look at now is um, how the shrimp fishery itself responds to hypoxia. Um, the Gulf shrimp fishery has historically been one of the uh, largest or most valuable single species fisheries in the U.S. Um, currently it's ranked fifth by value um, in the United States. It's a very large fishery. Uh, there's roughly 20,000 permitted vessels. Uh, about 250,000 vessel days shrimping per year. Uh, Overfishing over of shrimp and also bycatch of juvenile finfish and other protected species are, are, are the major management concerns. Um, the fisheries synoptic with the most severe the period of most severe hypoxia. Effort tends to peak in June, July on the shelf um, and it peaks in near shore regions where hypoxia is most severe. So to start to look at this, um, we've done a couple of things. We've done synoptic, aerial, and hydrographic surveys so that we can look at how the fishery was responding behaviorally to low oxygen or to how low oxygen is influencing the distribution of their target species. And more recently, we've started looking at vessel monitoring data um, where we have information on uh, the location and the time of actual shrimp toes across a large portion of the shrimp fleet. So for the aerial surveys, um, we chose two sampling sites uh, in these regions of the hypoxic zone. They're about 4,000 kilometers squared. Um, we flew 9 to 11 transects per site. Each one of those was sampled two times. And you can see the transects are these uh, are these lines here. Uh, they're spaced six kilometers apart. Uh, we, we used a SkyMaster uh, plane for this with two observers and a data recorder um, that marked the uh, location and documented the activities of, of shrimp vessels. And this was done with the uh, hydrographic and trawl survey I described earlier. So each one of these points is a trawl and hydrographic station um, done within the same time frame as the aerial survey. So these are synoptic on about a 10-day time scale. Just to give you a sense of uh, what things look like from the air, this is a shrimp vessel. You can see off in the distance, its nets are up, so it's transiting. You can see the trail here, and it's across this uh, this marine interface from browner fresh water to more green um, marine water. This is a typical shrimp boat trawler. Uh, that's actually the nets are in the water, uh, so you can see that they pull these uh, large nets from either outrigger and then a, a tri net down the center, which is a smaller net that's. Uh, used during shrimping, but more often towed al alone as a way of searching for concentrations of shrimp before dropping the, uh, the larger gear. This is another vessel that's just pulled up the nets here and is sorting a catch on the back deck. And then these are vessels anchored up offshore. So from the plane, we could actually uh, document the location of the vessels, but also uh, discern something about what they were doing, whether they were actually actively shrimping, uh, whether they were transiting, um, and if so, what direction, or whether they were stationary or anchored. So this is a similar map of the bottom oxygen um, layer with the shrimp vessel sightings overlaid on top of it. During this seven-day period, we sighted 123 vessels. You can see there's pretty clear avoidance of these low oxygen waters, the anoxic waters in black, with vessels both inshore and offshore of that region. This is for all vessels. Um, if you look at 
just the ones that are actively trawling, which is a little bit more than half of the ones that we cited. Uh, some of these ones that are in the hypoxic zone drop out, and some of these ones further offshore drop out. But still pretty clear avoidance um, on the part of the fishery. So we assigned a DO value to each sighted vessel based on the, the overlay of, of the siding data with that interpolated surface and then calculated a, an electivity index, which is basically the proportion of shrimpers in hypoxic versus normoxic water relative to the, the amount of survey effort there. And what you see is what was obvious in the, in the maps is that there's pretty clear avoidance of those low oxygen areas, uh, both when you look at all vessels and also when you look at uh, those that were actively trawling. <clears throat> what was a little harder to get at is whether, you know, and, and whether they are actually targeting those edge habitats where uh, shrimp densities were high. And there's some suggestion that that may be the case. This is the percentage of vessels versus distance from the edge of the hypoxic zone for vessels that were trawling in white and vessels that were not trawling in black. So if you look at those vessels that are trawling, they actively have, they have their nets in the water, see the highest percentage of those are occurring within about three kilometers of our estimate of where that edge is, um, whereas you don't see any relationship really with that edge when you look at the non-trawling vessels. And I've just included from the um, from the trawl data itself the the the, um, the distribution of distances for the highest 90th percent of shrimp toes and for all fin fish. So the point here is that it looks like a lot of the trawling effort is concentrated within a, a region uh, along the edges of the hypoxic zone where both shrimp densities and fin fish densities are, are typically high. So this suggests there might be some implications in terms of both shrimp harvest um, and uh, in terms of bycatch of, of juvenile fish. So we learned something about what's going on at local scales that shrimpers do appear to be avoiding hypoxic water or, or more likely just responding to hypoxia-induced changes in the, in the distribution of shrimp, potentially targeting edge habitats. Uh, we wanted to try to scale this up to the shelf-wide scale. Um, you know, this, is, this was a very localized study in a, in a particular region of the hypoxic zone. So we developed a, a collaboration with Jim Nance at the Galveston, the NIMPS Galveston Lab, and there they have a vessel monitoring program that's been in existence since 2004. Uh, I was piloted it in 2004 and 2005, and then it's been ongoing um, since then. And the goal here is, is not really to look at effects of hypoxia. It's more to get a, an accurate record of shrimping effort um, and how it's distributed spatially and temporally in the Northwestern Gulf, mostly for, for stock assessment purposes. But one of the, the good things about this data set is it's a random sample of shrimp vessels each year. So we're getting a random sample of the fleet that's being instrumented with what's called an electronic logbook that monitors the location of the vessel and the speed of the vessel every 10 minutes um, throughout the year. And there's an algorithm that, uh, that's been developed uh, at the Galveston lab to identify shrimp toes based on changes in vessel speed. So sh shrimpers, when they're towing, they're typically pulling their nets fairly slowly, two to three knots, and then when they're steaming, um, they're steaming more in the range of eight to ten knots. So from changes in vessel speed, uh, you can get some information on um, what their activity was. And this is a, it's a very dense data set that we've just, just started to tap into. Um, since 2006, there's been 200 to 450 vessels instrumented each year. Um, those, those vessels have conducted 17 to over 50,000 tows. Um, total tow hours have ranged from 62,000 to over 250,000. 
And so there's a lot of information or potential for information um, in this electronic logbook data. Just to give you a sense of what it looks like, on the left is all of the uh, ELB tows. So these are all the vessels in a given year that, that were instrumented. So it's a very dense, very dense data set. And then this kind of gives you some sense of the spatial structure of those tows. This is just a random selection of 10% of those vessels. And so we've taken a first cut at this. This is mostly work that's being done by Kevin Purcell, a postdoc at the lab. What we wanted to do was match the shrimping effort from the, from the electronic log books and bottom DO conditions on the shelf in space and time, and then apply some uh, geospatial regression models to relate effort to a suite of predictor variables. So, so what we did was interpolate uh, the bottom oxygen from the annual summer CMAP surveys, which occur in June and July. And then we applied a smoothing procedure to that interpolation uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty in the tow path. We actually we have information on where the tow started and the duration, but we don't know the direction or the, the tow path, the area that it covered. So we wanted to uh, account for that. And then we censored the ELB data uh, to match the temporal scale of that DO interpolation as best we could. So, so for each one degree of, of longitude, as you move across the northwestern gulf, we retain toes that were within, within a time frame uh, of the stations that were used to interpolate that region of the shelf. And so uh, this information is not matched exactly. We don't have exact information on the oxygen conditions where each tow was conducted. But it is synoptic uh, at about a two-week temporal scale. So um, we sign the auction values to the toes on that basis. And then we aggregated the toe and the DO data to a, to a grid and looked at three response variables. The total tow hours, so just a, a, a gross measure of fishing effort, the average tow duration in a grid cell, and then the number of toes in a grid cell. Um, or the toad density. So this just gives you an idea of what, uh, what the interpolation looks like. This is for two years, 2008, 2009. Uh, the CMAP stations are at the top. And then this is the smooth interpolated surface with the uh, low oxygen areas in red and higher oxygen areas in blue. And we applied a, a generalized data model framework to analyze these data. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but um, basically X is the tow, uh, the, t the number of hours towed in a grid cell um, on day D and year Y as a function of a year effect, a smooth effect of the DO conditions on that day and year in that location, uh, depth, which we used as a surrogate for other things that might be influencing the distribution of shrimpers. And then we had some nuisance parameters like shrimp, uh, shrimp price and daily fuel price, which we weren't particularly interested in, but we wanted to account for in the model. <clears throat> and then we had a variable coefficient term, which I'll, I'll describe more in a minute, um, where A is the area of hypoxia, um, and, and, and rho and phi are the actual spatial location of the grid cell. So this variable coefficient term is something uh, we were really interested in. Uh, it basically allows the model coefficient or the effect for the area of hypoxia to vary smoothly as a function of another, of another predictor variable. And so when that other predictor variable space, um, it's called a geospatial regression model, and this allows us to map the DO effect spatially to investigate the local effect of DO on shrimping efforts. So in effect, what we're doing is taking this coefficient and map, putting it on a map in space. So just to show you some of the plots here, this is the partial effect of depth. So this is depth increasing on the x-axis, and this is the effect on the total effort. And so what you see in Louisiana is mostly an inshore fishery, with a tapering off in effort as depth increases. Texas is mostly a mid-shelf and deeper water fishery, so 
Uh, you get most of the effort concentrated around 20 uh, meters depth and then off, further offshore. And then the DO effect differed between the two regions. So off Louisiana, uh, a lot of the, the shrimping effort was occurring, at least in the vicinity of low oxygen water. Uh, I don't want to say that this is actually where they were shrimping. We don't have the resolution in the, in the DO data to say that. But we do see a lot of the effort seems to be occurring, at least in the vicinity of low oxygen areas. Whereas off Texas, there's more of an avoidance of these low oxygen areas. And in both cases, you see the suggestion of an edge effect. And this is something we've seen uh, in the, the shrimp distribution data too, these sort of peaks in, in effort around two to three milligrams per liter, which is in the region of that edge effect. This is the uh, prediction surface. So uh, this is the average spatial effect. So what you're looking at is the distribution of shrimping effort predicted by the model on the shelf. So you tend to get high effort in Louisiana bite area and offshore, these regions in green, and then around Atchafalaya Bay, and then low effort uh, further west away from the plume, and then these regions uh, close to shore. And this is the map of the slopes of that area of hypoxia coefficient I mentioned before. So you can think of this as regions of the shelf where there's positive and negative effects of DO on the amount of shrimping effort. So the red is as area of hypoxia increases, effort tends to decline in these red areas, which tend to be concentrated in the western region of the shelf and in the, in the plume region here. And as area of hypoxia increases, effort increases offshore and then in these localized regions close to shore. So this gives us a way to map uh, what's an, an effect size, basically. We can say something about the direction and the magnitude of the effect of hypoxia on the local distribution of shrimping effort. And, and you can imagine some applications of this to, to various spatial management strategies or designing monitoring programs. Uh, I think it also may be relevant to some of the work that's going on here in developing spatially explicit food web models where you want to incorporate a, a harvest effect. This would be a way to map that in space. What we don't know is the actual catches associated with those toes. Um, so we don't have that information. We're trying to get that. But what we have looked at is the toe duration and the toe density. And what you see is in these low oxygen areas, both shorter toe durations, but more toes. And so that could be suggestive of one of two things. It could be that they're achieving high catch rates in a short amount of time, saturating their nets. Um, in the vicinity of these low oxygen areas. Um, I think that's uh, unlikely. I think what's more likely is that this is a searching process, that they're dropping those tri-nets in areas, searching for shrimps. That, that's a very um, short duration tow and, and using that to find high concentrations. Well, that's something we're hoping to um, get, the, uh, get the catch information from these, these data that we, um, so we can be able to tease that out. So in terms of what we've learned about hypoxia effects on the shrimp fishery, um, certainly it's, it seems that shrimpers avoid hypoxic areas and they appear to target these edge habitats where shrimp and finfish densities are high. Um, we do see shrimping efforts shift in response to changes in the aerial extent of hypoxia. Uh, there seems to be a general shift offshore, but also to localized regions inshore. Um, and this implies that uh, as I mentioned before, that there's potentially some effect on shrimp harvest and finfish bycatch uh, in these localized regions near the edges of the hypoxic zone. But that's, um, as of yet, it's still a, an untested hypothesis. We don't know that for sure. So what I want to do here in the last few minutes is something that we've just recently begun looking at in the last couple of months, and that's uh, trying to um, look at a, at a at a broader scale in terms of community and ecosystem indicators and whether we might see any uh, responses to hypoxia or, or other things happening in the Gulf. And an obvious question is, have shrimp landings declined? And, and we don't have a lot of evidence that shrimp landings, at least at a system-wide scale, have declined. These are the brown shrimp landings going back to the 19, 1960s. And you see high and low periods, but there's not an obvious 
temporal trend um, in shrimp landings. We've also looked at estimates of abundance, and this was uh, um, a little bit surprising when we calculated these. This is fr this is from a fishery independent survey, so they're they're not dependent. They're not fishery dependent data. Uh, croaker seemed to be fairly stable up until the early 2000s, and then they're starting to increase. Uh, brown shrimp, very similar, fairly stable trends, more variable, but you start to see these increases in shrimp abundance uh, in the early to mid 2000s. And so that seems to be associated with this dramatic decline that's occurred in shrimping effort uh, over the last 10 years. This shows the effort in the shrimp fishery from 1960 to present, so you see this ramp up in time with a peak in effort in the late 1980s, early 90s. And then over about a three-year period, we saw greater than a two-fold decline in shrimping effort. And uh, the thinking is that that's a, that's a response to probably most importantly imports, which have driven down the price of shrimp, but also uh, to some extent fuel prices and recent storms, um, Hurricane Katrina, that were occurring during that time period. But we haven't seen effort levels this low since the 1960s. We also looked at some other metrics, uh, pelagic to demersal ratio, and saw declines in the pelagic to demersal ratio again during the same time period, early, early 2000s. Similar patterns for the northwestern Gulf as a whole, off Texas and off Louisiana. This is opposite to what you'd expect if eutrophication and hypoxia were the major drivers. You'd expect uh, nutrients to stimulate pelagic productivity and hypoxia to negatively affect uh, benthic, our productivity of benthic species, which would result in a higher PD ratio. But in fact, we see the opposite here. And it seems to be driven by not the pelagics. Um, the pelagics over this time frame have been variable, but fairly no, no temporal trend. It's driven by demersals. And this looks like it's a release um, or a decrease in mortality due to bycatch um, that's driving this pattern. See the same kind of thing in other community indicators. Uh, these are various measures of uh, diversity, evenness, um, those sorts of things. And whether you're looking in the summer, the fall, Louisiana or Texas, we're, we're seeing these declines. Uh, they're beginning around the early 2000s associated with that big decline in shrimping effort. This is a traffic light plot that shows for 60 species, they're organized as directly harvested, high bycatch species, rare bycatch species are not reported. And there's two things that pull out of this. One is it looks like there's been a general decline in biomass from the 80s to the early 90s. You see a lot more green in the early part of the time series, a lot more red in the later part of the time series. But if you look at the recent increases, where increases are happening, they're happening in things that are directly harvested the shrimp, or that are very common uh, species uh, that are caught as bycatch. So, so our current thinking is that some, this is something that we're still exploring, is that these recent changes in fishing pressure that are occurring both on target and bycatch species, they're having pretty striking effects on population abundance and, and various community and ecosystem indicators. And those um, in some ways, those may supersede any effects of hypoxia, eutrophication, or at least uh, potentially mask those effects. So just to uh, conclude, hypoxia has large effects on the spatial distribution of mobile organisms. Uh, we're not finding strong evidence for effects of dem demographic rates and, and population dynamics that are associated with that habitat loss. The shrimp fishery certainly seems responsive to hypoxia-induced shifts in, uh, in the distribution of shrimp, but those effects may be fairly localized and not evident at the population or community level. Um, these recent declines in fishing effort that are driven primarily by external forces, uh, imports and fuel prices and so forth, have pretty acute and pretty obvious effects on community and ecosystem indicators. So I think with that, I'll um, 
I'll stop and thank the, the people that contributed to this work, and particularly Kevin Purcell, who's, who's, who's uh, done a lot of what I showed, as well as the NIMS and Gasca, Pascagoula, um, or the, the Pascagoula and Galveston Labs and the uh, C-Sport program for, for their funding support. So, thank you. Do we have any questions for, for Kevin, either here in the audience or on uh, through the webinar? Uh, thanks. I really enjoyed your talk. My question is regarding the thickness of the hypoxic layer. We've seen that it varies a lot from year to year, and I was wondering if that you know, affected any of your results at all, or if that was something that you looked at? Yeah, um, it's not, you're, you're right, it does vary from year to year. Um, it varies within the course of a survey. We've seen a lot of shoaling of low oxygen water that can result in thickening in certain regions, the hypoxic zone. Um, you know, I think people here are better able to answer that they've been looking at the vertical dimension. We did, um, a preliminary acoustic survey that did suggest there was uh, concentrations of fish biomass above the hypoxic zone, we're never able to really identify what it is. And so, you know, I can't, I, I spoke a lot to the, the horizontal dimension and that things are aggregating on the edge. And I think that is the most relevant to the fishery because it is, it's a bottom trawl fishery. Um, but yeah, what's going on in the vertical, um, is less certain. So, I mean, maybe Doran or somebody here could speak to that. Or not. <laughs> I mean, it, it is about a, me a meter or two thick. So, there, so, you know, there is plenty of oxygenated habitat above it. Um, but my suspicion is for a lot of the species that we're dealing with, things like croaker, uh, brown shrimp, they're so tightly associated with the bottom. They, you know, they're benthic feeders. Um, they might be able to use that vertical dimension temporarily um, as an avoidance or uh, to avoid low oxygen, but it doesn't seem like it's something that uh, they could do on a sustained basis. Uh, I'm interested in the, uh, the uh, uh, regression model. Is that all linear re uh, regression model or you have a quadratic form or interaction form together? Right. Well, this it's a generalized additive model, so so there's no assumptions about the functional form of those relationships, and so that's why you know you saw those curves that often have funny shapes right. because we're not making assumptions about whether that's a linear effect or a quadratic effect. It's completely driven by the data, and it's it's a smoothing sort of procedure to generate those curves. So. So there is some flexibility there in that you don't have to a priori um, decide on that functional form. It does draw some, you know, s s create some complications in terms of interpreting it. Um, you try this to look at the uh, uh, prediction skill if you use a quadratic form of a function or a, a predict, uh, I think a predictor for a variable, for example, uh, from based on your data, like for example, the temperature and then you should use the quadratic form rather than you use the linear form to do the regression model. Mm -hmm. well, quadratic form gives you a global This gives you a global Yeah I saw Yeah I saw some of the individual part you have you have a not linear form. And then when you do the regression model, you use a linear form. And uh, that, I mean, no, what I mean is uh, if you use nonlinear form, maybe you will improve the prediction skill. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that I look at it is the GAMs are a first cut where you're essentially, you know, not making assumptions about the functional form. Now, you can use it to inform that functional form. So a next, next step, I mean, you can look at some of those graphs, and some of them might look quadratic. There's a couple that kind of you know, looked linear, maybe had some asymptote associated with them. You could use that to parameterize a, you know, a parametric model, um, but we haven't done that. We've just, so far, we've just looked at the, the smooths themselves and tried to you know, discern what we could from, from the data. 
Any other questions? Let me check the web here. Yeah. No, que no questions on the web. So any of our webinar participants can type in a question and I'll ask it. Um, thanks. It's a really nice talk. Um, I have a question about the uh, um, vessels of the shrimp. You give a table. It sounds it's increasing every year from 2006 to 2010 or 2011. But later on, you said the fishery pressure is decreasing, cause the increase in the population dynamics. Yeah, so, so you're saying that there was a trend in the number of vessels that were outfitted with the electronic log books from right, 2006, right. so it was like, increasing yeah. at the same time that the fishery itself was decreasing, right. or that the total effort in the fishery was decreasing. That's one thing, you know, we haven't looked at that. Um, even given that ELB program, that's a very small percentage of the total fleet. I mean, we're, we're talking about... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing a one to five percent at most of the fleet, and so um, I'm not sure that you know the decline in effort would necessarily influence the the representativeness of, of those those vessels in terms of the total fleet. If that's what you're asking. Okay. So the data you you see the log book is that yeah it's not representing the total fishery pressure. No, it, well, it's a random sample of vessels, right? Okay, so there's a random sample of the fishery, and that's maybe that's been increasing a little bit over time, as you suggested from, from looking at that table. Um, the presumption is because that's a random sample, it's reflective of the fleet. But if you look at the whole fleet and the total amount of effort, you know, there has been a decline over that period. I guess what I'm saying is that the ones that are outfitted with log books are, the, are, so, are such a small proportion anyway that whether they're a proportion of, you know, the effort in 2002 or the twofold decline that occurred over the subsequent three years, it's still a pretty small, small proportion. Uh, Another question: mm -hmm. When you do the um, measure the uh, size of the animal aggregation size, how do you define the size of the patch size? That's a good question. That's uh, I did that a while ago. So we um, we used something called contact statistics, where which is basically you um, for each individual station you can't you calculate the the density of animals within concentric rings of increasing size and then you average that across stations um, and it gives you and then you look for for where some some peak occurs and that gives you an average patch size for the system so I, I could point you to the papers I'm not sure I can explain it uh, on the fly it has been a while since I did that but, it, but you can think of it as, as you know, is that there is some patch structure out there you know, and you can characterize it in various ways. One way to characterize it would just be a strict average patch size. And what we were getting at is that seems to have changed over time and it's gotten much smaller. So things are concentrated in smaller areas at higher density. And um, that seems consistent with some of the other things we're seeing in terms of the avoidance behavior and the aggregation effects. Yeah, you'd have a third dimension to deal with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah I had a question on your, was it a, do you call it a stoplight plot? Or a, I meant to say tra traffic light okay. plot. Yeah. Well, you may have said that, but okay. I wasn't familiar with it. Um, you showed early declines across species and then later recoveries in the species that were most directly affected by the commercial fishery. But none of the others seemed, or the, you didn't see that recovery in the non, non right. species. Any any explanation for why? I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean that's a good question. Um, I don't. I, I, I don't know. I mean, we have a basically a thirty-year data set. We've seen this period of kind of um, low abundance early, and then or high, you know, 
was it low abundance early or high abundance early and then decreasing abundance across the board between the 80s early 90s and the 2000s what may be driving that I'm not I'm not sure yeah. any other questions okay well thank you very much for your talk thank you this concludes the webinar and the seminar.